You know, we, we heard in the news yesterday, actually, it was very comforting to a lot of families and parents that parents will be allowed to register the name of their stillborn child under the Stillbirths and Births Miscellaneous Amendments Bill introduced just in Parliament yesterday. Now, the aim of allowing the registration of a stillborn child's name is to help grieving parents, according to the Ministry of Home Affairs. And also the definition of a stillborn child will be changed, mm. with stillbirth referring to the death of a baby after the 24th week of pregnancy, which is uh, the second trimester, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Up from after the 22nd uh, week. Right. So for more, Dr. Tanning Loy is joining us, an obstetrician gynecologist, uh, EK and EL Women's Clinic, and visiting consultant with the Singapore General Hospital. Dr. Tan, can you remind our listeners, when we're talking about the concept and the term stillbirth, in layman's terms, what does it refer to? Hi, Daniel and Hui. Uh, uh, nice to talk to you again. Um, well, the definition of a stillbirth is basically a baby that is born with no signs of life. So different countries use different cutoffs for the minimum number of weeks the pregnancy must have lasted you know, to be classified as a stillbirth. So, uh, and anything that's earlier than a cutoff is considered as a miscarriage. So the World Health Organization actually defines a stillbirth as a baby born with no signs of life at or after 22 weeks of pregnancy. But it's also recommending that a 28-week cutoff be used for international comparison. So actually for the longest time, WHO has been using 28 weeks. But I think it's re- only recently that they have changed the definition of 22 weeks. But I think for basis of comparison, I think they're still using 28 weeks as a cutoff. So taking that into account, now that we've changed the definition, and of course the, the yes. naming convention now being important as part of this amendment to this bill as well, talk to us about the wider impact you think that this will have. You've worked with families and parents who have been through this tragic yes. instance. What will it mean to them? I think uh, the first thing that we, we need to consider is obviously you know this uh, consideration to change the definition from 22 to 24 weeks. All right. So, I mean, as I mentioned, the definition of stillborn child used to be after the 28 week of pregnancy, all right? And uh, WHO kind of lowered it uh, to 22 weeks, uh, basically because uh, they were trying to collect uh, statistical data. So that was based on that international classification of disease. And I think as reported in the news recently, uh, a woman can actually legally get an abortion in Singapore up to a 24 week pregnancy. And why we use 24 weeks is basically because uh, this is based on medical and scientific evidence that the baby's uh, ability to actually survive outside the mother's womb, right? Ideally, it should be about 24 weeks thereabouts. So although there have been reports of extremely premature babies surviving even at about 22 weeks of pregnancy, uh, these are the exception rather than the norm. Right. And about half of babies that are born at even at 24 weeks, you know, only half will survive in the longer term. But many of them actually end up with longer term uh, and possibly lifelong complications and handicap. So it's always very tricky, right? The decision whether to resuscitate a premature baby between 22 to 24 weeks of pregnancy, this is always a difficult choice. And it needs to be made after very detailed discussion between the medical team and the parents involved. So I believe that raising the definition of a stillbirth to 24 weeks will lessen the confusion for parents facing you know, these difficult and important decisions about medical interventions for their unborn child and to also ease the pressure uh, some doctors may actually face from parents to resuscitate or use more liberal treatment for their affected babies. Now, when it comes to stillbirth, what are the possible causes that might lead to it? Well, more than half of stillbirths, unfortunately, are unexplained, all right? But there are some uh, women with risk factors uh, that may actually increase their risk of having uh, stillbirth. So, for example, I think one out of five women, pregnant women in Singapore may be actually affected by diabetes. And we know, uh, you know, quite, uh, this is uh, quite common knowledge that poor control of diabetes is an increase, uh, uh, leads to an increased risk for experiencing stillbirth. Uh, on top of that, we are also seeing uh, mothers who are conceiving at an older age, and it is recognized that older mothers, particularly above the age of 40, are at increased risk of experiencing stillbirths. Uh, other than that, uh, other less common issues, well, sometimes we see babies that might be affected because the placenta itself uh, is not functioning well, so we can't su- uh, supply enough oxygen, can't su- supply enough nutrients. So some of these babies get restricted in terms of their growth potential, so they're at increased risk of, ex- uh, of you know, uh, uh, these mummies of these babies are at increased risk of actually experiencing stillbirth. Uh, other than that, there are some other causes, including infections. Some babies may have genetic problems or birth defects beforehand, right? And there are also some mummies who may develop medical conditions in pregnancy. Uh, the classical one being a liver disease in pregnancy known as obstetric cholestasis, uh, which for some reason puts these mothers at increased risk of actually experiencing a stillbirth. And does that mean if those factors remain that future pregnancies and births will also be very challenging? 
Well, that's always very tricky, right? So I would say that for the majority of mummies uh, with no explained uh, reason for experiencing a stillbirth, uh, the prognosis is generally very, very uh, positive, right? I think in my experience, I've seen uh, some patients who have experienced an unexpected stillbirth before in their first pregnancy, who then go on to have uh, uncomplicated pregnancies, you know, subsequently. And, and you know, uh, uh, off, 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 offhand, I can remember at least uh, one mother who had actually gone on to deliver two other babies, right, with uh, no complications at all throughout. But certainly, I think for a mummy who may have pre-existing disease like diabetes, then uh, it's going to be a little bit, little bit more challenging. Uh, not impossible to actually have a healthy birth in the future, right? But certainly, I think these mummies will need to see their doctors regularly, make sure that their disease is well under control, Right, so that when uh, they get pregnant, the risk is uh, as uh, reduced as possible. And how do you feel about the um, other aspect of the amendment, the fact that parents will be able to register the name of their stillborn child? This is going to be wonderful in supporting them through what must be a very difficult time. Yes, I think that's a, actually a very positive step forward. I think judging from you know the uh, reports we've read over the news for the last few days, um, in general, I think whenever we encounter a stillbirth, right, we will encourage the parents right to basically see you know hold and touch their baby, right. Although this may be a difficult moment for them, uh, they will usually be offered opportunities to create some memories, take some photos, right, uh, make some memorabilia for their baby, right, so as to remember this baby. Uh, and as part of the grieving process, it helps the families actually cope with their loss. Uh, in certain cases, they may even get a chance to arrange, you know, for a religious uh, cremation or burial, you know, of the stillborn baby. So I think uh, allowing them to register the name of the stillbirth, you know, is part of this process, which will help them uh, go through their grief, right, help them to come to terms with their loss. Dr. Tan, thank you so much for helping us understand this very sensitive uh, situation that some families go through in Singapore. Dr. Tan Ingloy there.